Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to B-Size Las Vegas. We are here for the Password Con. Appreciate you coming to hear from Mackenzie Jackson, who's going to be talking about are your secrets safe? No, they're not. We know they're not. Find a millions of credentials and mobile apps. Just a few things we want to say. Thank you to our sponsors, especially the Diamond sponsors, Adobe and our gold pri Primus. Primus? Prisma, sorry. <laughs> Cloud, Blue Coat, Toyota, and Conductor One. It's their support along with yours that makes this what it is. Cell phones, please turn them off. We don't want to hear it. If somebody's calling, it better be God. Also, if you have any questions, save them for the end because we, she, he doesn't want to be interrupted. So, on that note, let's get started. Mackenzie, all yours. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> That was, uh, that introduction is probably like going to be the highlight of this talk. So <laughs> but uh, thank you all for coming here. I'm really excited to be presenting at B-Sides uh, Las Vegas. Uh, this has been one of the, one of my goals to be able to present at this conference. I have a, a funny story before we start is uh, last year I was a volunteer and I was on the registration desk um, and I was chatting to the people on the registration desk to me and I was with three other CISOs. So uh, if the CISOs are the people that are volunteering here, I'm kind of terrified to know what the audience members are, but I'm uh, really happy to, uh, to be presenting here. So my name is Mackenzie. A little bit about me before we get started. Uh, I'm from Aotearoa, New Zealand, uh, but today I live in the Netherlands. And I work for a French company, so there's a range of, uh, of, uh, of countries there. You can find me anywhere on social media, the handle at Advocate Mac. Uh, and I also am the host of the Security Repo podcast. It's my mum's favorite podcast. She hasn't missed an episode, uh, and it would be really great. She, she recommends it to you. Uh, if you want live dangerously, there's a QR code. Scan at your own risk uh, to take you to that. All right, we'll get into the, the topic. So what we're going to talk about uh, in this session is really discovering secrets. So we're going to talk in originally, initially about kind of secrets. Now we're in passwords con, so I don't need to spend too much time about this, why they're a problem. Then we're going to look at discovering secrets in source code. I'm not going to spend too much time about this because the presentation after me is actually going to go deeper into it. But this is kind of what kicked off uh, my interest in mobile apps specifically. And then we're going to talk about discovering secrets in these compiled applications, downloading them and finding them. Uh, finally, we'll talk a little bit about how to securely store secrets, and then we'll, we'll have a go into some questions. All right, so just quickly, um, I'm sure everyone here is familiar, so, but just in case to get everyone on the same page, what do I mean when I'm talking about secrets? So I'm talking about digital authentication credentials. Uh, these can be things like API keys, security certificates, credential peers, and the, the key difference here is that these are made to be used programmatically and generally machine to machine. Right, so I have yet to successfully memorize an API key um, and use it. These are uh, meant to be used by our systems to authenticate themselves. Now, why that's important is because when things are made to be used programmatically, they often end up hard coded or in the wrong place because humans still handle them, even though machines use them. And so that's really what we're going to be talking about now is uh, identifying where they've kind of leaked out of where they're, where they're meant to be, uh, how we can identify them and, and how we can use them. So why do secrets exist? A question I ask myself every day. Um, but if we take just a kind of a, mo a modern application, a mobile application, um, you know, secrets are used because of a shift in how we build our software. You know, our applications aren't monoliths that do everything. We connect to lots of different services. So, you know, the easy one to talk about is something like Okta, where are you going to build your own authentication, or do you outsource that to a service that has has is doing just that? You know, that or do you use Algolia for search? Do you do your own credit card processing, or do you outsource that to Stripe? Especially if you're trying to get around the 30% fees that the app stores charge. Um, but um, applications quickly end up of these are compiled of these different services and they all communicate with secrets but it doesn't stop there because we have to have back-end infrastructure we have to have testing we have code that we need to deal with so then our infrastructure also uses lots of these secrets now our mobile application needs to talk to these as well uh, potentially through the back end but they still exist as secrets and then it doesn't stop there because we want to monitor it. We, we need to have monitoring of it. Perhaps we want to have crash logs being sent somewhere from the app. So they, we need secrets to be able to do that and get information. And these are all potential access points 
and we haven't even talked about the microservices that we create. So your simple little mobile application very quickly turns into a collection of all these different services, all doing different things, and we need to authenticate with each of them. And we do this through secrets, but every single one of these points, if I'm an attacker, this is a potential entry. If I can gain access to, to something, even if it doesn't seem that interesting, you may not think that me getting access to a Slack channel is important. I'm gonna talk about that exa exact example later. But as an attacker, I can do lots of different things to be able to abuse that and leverage that to elevate my privileges and gain access into you know, lots of different areas. All right, so how should secrets be stored? This is gonna be a very, very simplistic uh, example. Um, but just before we get into all the bad things that happen, we'll talk about how it's meant to happen. So we have our front-facing applications. For Android, this is an APK. For Apple, this is an IPA. Uh, we shouldn't have any secrets in these. Now, unsurprisingly, we, we, we're going to discover that there's lots of secrets in here. But this is, we really shouldn't. We should have our secrets stored in our back end, you know, perhaps through a secrets manager. Um, or just in our cloud infrastructure, they often have Secrets Manager. We want them loaded into our local memory, and that's what communicates with the third-party services and sends our data securely to our application. This is how it should be set up. Um, but often, lots of things uh, change. People cut corners, or they feel like they're doing it more efficiently, or they'll come up with lots of arguments as to why the insecure way they're doing it is actually secure. I'll talk through some of them uh, as we go through. But this is really how it should be done but it's not often how it is done in practice. So let's get into the first part of this, uh, finding secrets in source code. As I said, I'm not gonna ha like go too deep into this. Uh, if you're really interested, the talk after me will go deeper. Uh, but I want to address this because this is really what made me start thinking about secrets inside source code, inside mobile applications, uh, based on some initial research I was doing in source code. So to give an idea, the State of Secret Sprawl is a report that GitGuardian, the company I work for, uh, releases every year. And one of the things that we do is we monitor public uh, uh, code repositories to try and identify if secrets are leaked in there. Um, now, the biggest one is obviously GitHub. So GitHub has huge amounts of information. There was more than a billion commits or contributions made to public repositories in GitHub last year. Uh, and we scanned every single one of those to try and identify uh, how many secrets are out there in public repositories. So last year we found 10 million. So 10 million secrets, and we validate a lot of these. So this isn't 10 million random high entropy strings that look like secrets, but are just you know, URLs or unique identifiers. No, this is 10 million secrets that we're fairly confident um, are true positives. So this is a huge amount of information. Uh, if you want to win some candy, if you remember this number for the next presentation, it's going to come up. Um, but we looked at the file extensions that we had. And I got an interest because we we're going through lots of information and I wondered uh, how many of these, how many mobile applications, uh, uh, how many of these would actually concern mobile applications because I had heard a lot about mobile applications being breached, passwords being found in there. So I wanted to use this research and this information to get a deeper understanding of how these mobile applications are actually using secrets. Now, truth be told, I'm not a mobile dev. Um, I've, I've, I've driven into this, into this topic uh, from a security perspective and learned along the way. But there's a bunch of uh, files that really are specific to mobile applications that kept coming up in our research. So if we look at some of them, the dot properties, now obviously these aren't only exclusive to mobile applications, but ones that we're, when looking into, they're frequently related to mobile applications. XML files were often related to uh, mobile applications, and the plist file, which is nearly always related to iOS uh, development. And so when I had a look into these, I did some further research to find out how many of these uh, contain secrets and what are the, some of the file names that we had. So if we're looking just at Android applications, the main one that we were discovering secrets in was the Android manifest.xml. We found 23,000, nearly 24,000 secrets in this one XML file. Um, you know, other ones as well, strings.xml was a big one that was related to Android developments. Uh, there's a long list of, X of, of these files that we can go down. Here are some of them. And just the last one, I always like to add in a funny one. Uh, API key.properties. Feels like something that probably shouldn't be in a public Git repository. Uh, definitely not, but we still find you know, 65 of these uh, keys being leaked. 
Uh, so this is interesting. We found similar results when we looked at iOS, uh, Android application specific. The main one that we found was the Google services-info.plist. Uh, this is a, a, a file that's generally always related to Google services and namely Firebase. Um, now, by default, this shouldn't really be that sensitive because it should only contain your Firebase ID. This might be useful for attacker, but not really. But then people started doing really weird things. They started adding secret keys into this file as well. I guess maybe it's handy to have both of them together. Uh, and we started seeing lots of weird secrets inside these. And also lots of other ones. And again, API keys.plist feels like someone that shouldn't be in a Git repository, uh, but often is. So when we looked at all of these files, it, it really got me, it got me thinking is to if these are the types of files that are containing secrets in public Git repositories, then it really has to be that in private Git repositories, the problem is much worse. And if this is the flow, that means that the application at the end is going to have those secrets in it. So looking at this source code uh, really got me thinking of to that ultimately these secrets are going to end up in the app mobile application. Um, and so that's what kind of started me off for this. First, I want to talk about exploiting uh, secrets in these, in these public source code. I'm not going to spend too long about it, but just bring it up. How would an attacker that's specifically looking at exploiting a mobile application uh, be able to discover these types of files in public places like GitHub? So generally, when secrets leak, for applications, they, know, they don't leak in an official repository. They leak in a repository attached to an employee that maybe accidentally leaked something uh, or is starting their own project that doesn't realize there's secrets in the history that belong to their organization. But there's a couple of, of ways. So firstly, this is a kind of my least favorite way, but I'll talk about it briefly because it's the easiest. You can just use the GitHub search feature, what we call GitHub dorking. So we know that the Android manifest.xml has lots of files. So if I'm looking for to exploit an Android application, I might narrow this down to uh, specific keywords. I'm looking for an API key. And there's lots of different types of these dorks uh, that we could do. This isn't a great method. The reason why most of the secrets that you find in source code are in the Git history. When you're using the GitHub search feature, it doesn't search the history. It just searches the top level or the kind of the latest version on the main branch. So there's a much better way that we can programmatically try and find these keys inside mobile applications. And that's using the GitHub API. So we have this uh, uh, AP events API. If you, anyone can go to it, you can do it on your phone right now. It's api.github.com forward slash events. Everything that happens publicly on GitHub is on this ledger, is on this uh, API. So what we can do is we can start using uh, the public events and the push events to try and find uh, code that uh, or code for, for things that shouldn't be in GitHub. For instance, narrowing it down to the Android manifest and strings. This is a huge amount of information to digest. But if you're uh, trying to exploit a mobile application, if you know that it's going to be an Android manifest XML or strings XML, that's going to give you your most amount of uh, most amount of prizes, then we can narrow it down and all of a sudden this fire hose starts becoming digestible. Uh, so this is really some of the ways that we can do it. And also if I'm trying to exploit a specific mobile application, then what I might do is I might discover what employees are working for that, if they have personal GitHub accounts and then abusing this API to try and find uh, files that relate to this specifically for them. Uh, but there's enough about source code. All of this sent me off down this journey of trying to figure out how mobile applications can be breached. Um, can, can, they, can we find the secrets inside of them? And exactly how do we go about doing that? Uh, all right, so let's get into that. So firstly, uh, on the Play Store, you, this is probably something of what you see. And we look at these and we're trying to figure out what are mobile applications in their raw form? If I, how can you download it? So, uh, most people make the mistake that non-human readable means secure. So when we su submit an APK file to the Android Play Store or an IPA file to the, uh, uh, to the Apple Play Store, we all think that, okay, this is, this, or a lot of people seem to think that this is a, some kind of black box. It's not human readable. You can't really extract any information from it from just that file. So that means it must be secure. 
it's totally unhackable, uh, but that's absolutely wrong with so many things uh, <laughs> like this. Uh, same with packages, same with containers. Uh, so what we started doing is trying to, first step is to turn these files back into something that's human readable. And it's very easy. So there's two types of files when we're looking at mobile applications. So the first file that we, we have is the IPA from Apple, and the second file is the .apk uh, from Android. And so what are these? These are basically glorified zip folders that we can use to extract the source code. And once we've extracted the source code from them, then we can, uh, we can start looking into them to try and find any sensitive information that may be in here. So how do we actually uh, find these secrets? So I'm gonna run through quickly. Uh, if you guys all say a prayer to the demo gods, I'm gonna <laughs> hopefully uh, this will all work. Uh, but the first thing that I want to do is I just want to show you how easy it is to extract these files. So here I have two. I have my Android app.apk and my iOS app.ipa. These are real files that I've downloaded from the respective Play Stores um, or App Store. So uh, that I've kind of chosen at random, but I've removed their name because there's some sensitive information uh, inside of here that I don't want to get in trouble for disclosing. Uh, just give me a minute. Okay, so the first step is we need to try and get this back to something that's uh, human readable. So to do this, well, I guess the first step is we need to download it. So you'll notice that you can't download these on your computer. You need to use some kind of uh, mirror or some kind of tool. So there's an easy one for Android applications called uh, Gplay Downloader. So I use that to download the application. Then I'm gonna use a different tool called uh, JDAC. To, which is a decompiler to get this back to its original form. So just to show you what that looks like. Uh, it's just gonna take a few seconds, um, and then that's going to be able to spit out and take me back to the source code, because once you have the source code, then really you can actually uh, start doing some interesting things and, and, and looking for uh, some files. So now that we've done that, let's open up uh, what we've just created here. So this here is the source code uh, of, the, of the application that we've downloaded. So here you'll see the Android manifest. We've talked about this file. So this is where I can already start to find some interesting information and go through in here. And also we know that there's, there's some other files uh, very interesting like the strings.xml, uh, which we can find uh, in various files. Um, here to try and get information about uh, uh, and see if there's any strings hidden in there. The, the problem with this is that these are really massive files and buried under all of this may be something interesting, maybe. Uh, and hackers, or at least I am, are very lazy, uh, so we're always gonna find a better way to do it. So what I wanna do now is just show you what I would do in real life. Um, is this is what I was is this scan this file uh, for secrets. So I'm using a tool called GG Shield. Uh, fair warning, this is a tool that uh, Git Guardian, my employee, creates. So I'm wildly biased as to why I, I use this, uh, but it's definitely the best. Totally. Um, whenever I'm on stage, I forget how to spell the most basic words. I told you. I was just checking to see if everyone's awake, you know, <laughs> making sure everyone's paying attention. It feels wrong, but uh, let's give it a go. All right, so this is going to take uh, just a little bit of time. Uh, oh. Huh? Okay, this is going to take just a little bit of time to scan, so I want to uh, go back to something else. So I've easily shown you how to extract the, um, 
the, the Android application. Now, I do want to warn you that iOS application is much more complicated, uh, so I hope you pay close attention and take lots of notes as to how we can do this. So what we need to do in an Android application is we take here our .ipa and we change this to .zip. And we have a look in here. And we have our source code <laughs> from this. So hopefully you, hopefully you took uh, lots of notes on how to do that. I can't do it again. Um, but yeah, that's really how interesting. So when I mentioned that these are glorified zip folders, particularly for the iOS version, I'm like absolutely dead serious. These are literally glorified zip folders. So now that we have the source code, we've extracted that, it's really easy. If there's a hard-coded secret in, in your source code, it's going to end up in your application. Uh, and we can easily extract it using simple tools, or in the case of iOS, not even using any tools uh, at all. So I'll try and see what my scanning is doing. Uh, we'll wait a little bit. These are all, okay, we're all done. So we'll go up to the top, and these are some of the secrets that we've found. I want to stress again, this is a real application downloaded from the Play Store. Um, but I have hidden all the secrets, so you can't do anything malicious with it. So the first secret that we sent, we've got some valid Google API keys. Uh, these can be interesting. These are in a Java file so that we know that these are, are hard-coded. When we decompile things, obviously we don't get the original names. We lose a lot of information. It's human readable, but it's, uh, we don't have everything that was there. But we can see that we have these Google API keys. Here we have something very, uh, and we all can, also can see that these are valid. So we've checked to see if these are valid, so we can use these. We also have Google OAuth keys. We can't check these automatically, but these can be extremely uh, sensitive, uh, depending on the setup. We have Facebook app keys. And we also said we have here some uh, Slack webhooks, and these, these are valid. I find Slack webhooks literally everywhere because people kind of assume that they're not that sensitive. And in some ways that they aren't. So what does this Slack hook uh, allow me to do? This Slack hook allows me to be able to post information into a private Slack channel. What's the use case for this? I'm going to assume probably that this may be some error or debug uh, uh, logging that's being sent. But when something happens, it kind of gets sent, a, a crash log gets sent to a, a Slack, uh, Slack channel. That's interesting. But me, as someone that's malicious, I can do lots of things. Like I can create some clever uh, phishing messages in there to say that, hey, this integration has disconnected. Please re-log in or something like that. Go to a mirror of Slack and get people to give me their credentials. Now, it doesn't always work. But it's, it works a lot of the time because how else would I have that Slack webhook, right? You've broken down some barrier of trust. I'm not a Nigerian prince emailing you. I am, I'm your own system telling you you need to update your information. So this is, the info, this is kind of what we get. And it keeps going down some more webhooks in different areas. Um, and we have a couple in, I'm trying to find this interesting files here. And here we have the strings XML. So this is obviously what we found. So what I found originally on GitHub that led me down this path to kind of wonder if this is interesting, you know, translates into the app. People were putting secrets and strings on XML and putting it onto public Git repositories. Then I wondered, hey, does that mean they're going to be in the app? Turns out it exactly means that they're going to be in the app, uh, as we can see right here. So this is just the process that I used for Android. I downloaded it called G with a Gplay. I decompiled it with JDEX, and then I scanned it with uh, ggShield. Uh, so you know this is very simple. There's other tools out there too, and, and and this isn't that complicated. Honestly, I would say that this is definitely at the level of a script kitty, uh, or even below, um, where you can you can just go through go through this. You can pipe these all together um, and just. Download download apps all day long and try and find sensitive information. I'm going to talk about when we've done that and what we've found later on. But we definitely, uh, this is my backup demo just in case it failed. Um, and the similar process for, uh, for Apple apps. I used a tool called IPA uh, tool to download it. Apple won't let, you, won't let you download anything unless it's on a, a mobile. So what this tool does is basically trick it into thinking it's on a mobile. It uses your Apple ID, and you can download it there. There's also lots of mirrors online um, where you can just download files. Uh, you just change the extension. You don't even need a tool to decompile it, and then you scan it with ggShield. Uh, so again, really simple, about the level of a script kitty uh, to be able to do this. So we're not talking about highly sophisticated attackers. If we were, I probably wouldn't be presenting, to be honest. 
So let's talk about when uh, this breach, a breach that's actually happened. So this one here is from uh, Jason Haddock. This is a story that he told on the, on the Security Repo podcast. That's a great episode if you want to check out. Uh, and this is about when he was doing a penetration test on a, a bank uh, application. So if you don't know Jason, he's an absolute legend uh, in, in the field. He's, he's uh, been a very highly regarded uh, penetration tester himself. Uh, he has a checkered pass, which you can hear about on the Darknet Diaries episode with him. Um, but this is an inter interesting example to, to show that this happens in real life. So there was a bank that uh, had a mobile application and Jason decided was doing a penetration test and downloaded that uh, application and started playing around with it. This particular bank application had a functionality. Um, so apparently in America, uh, United States, you guys still use checks. That baffles the rest of us. Um, <laughs> but, but one of the features of this was that you could take a picture of your check and cache it you know, all in the app. So when Jason decompiled this, he looked at how this and found that actually these images were being stored unencrypted uh, on, on you know, in in in, his, in the mobile device. Um, so he kind of figured, well, if that's being stored unencrypted somewhere, that means it's being sent unencrypted somewhere, and if I can get access to that, that would be great. Uh, so what did he, he found that there was a bit, uh, S3 big bucket, uh, S3 bucket that these were being sent to inside the app. And again, we're talking about a we're talking about a tier one bank here. Just we're not talking about Bob's financials. Um, we're talking about a, a bank that I can't disclose because he didn't disclose to me. Um, which is probably a good call. Uh, and then in that, there was a hard-coded uh, secret for that Amazon S3 bucket. And then with that, Jason was able to access that Amazon S3 bucket and find 10,000 images uh, of unencrypted, unencrypted images of checks from this. So this isn't something that just ra like happens to you know, small applications. This is something that's widespread uh, where secrets often end up inside our mobile applications because we honestly think that we don't understand how easy it is to do it. And when you're putting something in an APK online, you're putting up your source code. You should absolutely remember that. So you want to make sure that your source code is basically consider it open source uh, and, and expect the same security measures from that. So this is just a real life example of when this has happened um, uh, out in the world. So uh, what, about the, what about other examples of discovering secrets on the Play Store? So there's actually uh, a, a few research uh, that have been done on this. Znet published that there was 12,000 Android apps that they found that contained secrets. And Cyber News last year did a great, a great study on that. And I'm going to shamelessly steal uh, their information uh, and talk about that. Uh, I did a webinar with Cyber News. We did a full hour on their research. So I'm going to talk about it for five minutes. If it interests you, again, scan at your own risk. There's a QR code if you want to live dangerously uh, on, their, on, on their YouTube channel of that webinar. Uh, that we did together. But I'm just going to briefly talk about uh, some of the findings that they, they did. So the main statistics, how many applications contained hard-coded credentials of some kind? About 55%, so more than half. Now, before, before everyone gets too shocked by this, not all secrets are the same. Not everything's going to give me access to your Amazon S3 bucket. There are some secrets that we discover that I would still definitely consider secrets that I wouldn't want an attacker to have, but won't necessarily give you uh, access to the kingdom. But it would certainly be used as part of a, uh, a, bigger, a bigger attack to be able to understand and get more information. Um, but still, I would consider that the, the correct way would be to have zero. Uh, so the fact that we have nearly 56% uh, is definitely very alarming. So what was the main, uh, the main secrets that were found? So this, this study uh, actually only looked at the strings.xml file. It didn't, look, it didn't scan the whole source code because it, that would have taken too long for the, the research project size. Um, but we're, we're, we're going deeper into that now. The number one was Google storage buckets. So this is really closely in line with the example that we just saw. Data being sent from the app. So the reason why, or I'm just taking guesses of these things, but the reason why I think that is because, I mean, you're sending data directly from the application uh, to, to the bucket. It feels uh, unnecessary to go through the back end or something like that. It feels more efficient, but it's a terrible idea if you're going to hard code those credentials. Um, other ones, Firebase URLs. Uh, we found lots of these. These aren't necessarily uh, uh, 
exploitable uh, by default. However, it requires that you've configured your Firebase uh, really well. And often what we find is that things like this with like Firebase the, the, the default is insecure. The default is poorly configured. Why? Because companies want you to be able to get up and running quickly. Because if you can't, if you have to sign your app and get all get and get lots of security working to send a mess to send your first message on Firebase, then maybe you'll use a different service because it's too complicated to get started. But then we don't go back and actually correct and make it more secure. So lots of things like this, uh, Facebook app IDs, lots of different types of secrets that we've found uh, on were, that were on here. The top ad categories, ad categories that Cyber News found, um, health and fitness was up there, but honestly, no category was immune. You know, we talked about the example of the financial sector, so this shows that it, you know really everyone is suffering uh, from these programs uh, almost equally. So there's no kind of avenue of that someone that's doing really well on health and fitness uh, uh, sucks. So, uh, and just to talk about it. Um, a little bit after we did this research, I decided to have a look. It was at the time where there was endless amounts of chat GPT, yeah, I said it right, chat GPT uh, uh, apps popping up where they're basically mirroring it so that you got chat GPT on your, on your mobile application. I scanned about 10 of these and I found nine of them had their open, a, open, a, uh, open API keys hard-coded directly into them. So there's lots of different areas that uh, you can find. That one I found particularly shocking. All right. So how do you securely store your secrets on your mobile apps? How do we hide these effectively so that the attacker can't uh, actually use them? So the correct answer is that you don't. You don't put your secrets on your mobile application. You put them on the server side. Um, so, uh, and then people will often say, well, if it's on the server side, I have to connect to that server. Yeah, you do. And we just do that like any other application, right? You probably have some kind of login area. You log into your mobile application that authenticates the user with the back end, and then you can do the heavy lifting on the back end. That is the only way. There's no way to be able to hide your API keys effectively if they're on, uh, if they're on the mobile application. So the only caveat to that is if the mobile application themselves is creating the keys. So what I mean by that is in the example of the bank where they, were, they didn't encrypt the images, the app could create an encryption key, store this securely on the device and the hardware that's designed for that, and use it to encrypt it. But we can't use API keys to connect to anything outside of that app. Uh, and the other one is if you have a public application with no login, well, then you have a public app, and you should be receiving public information. Nothing sensitive should be coming from that. Um, so we don't need to worry about it. And please don't hard code API keys in there. All right, so uh, here's some arguments that people always get to me. Uh, what about encrypting keys in Base64? And if you want to throw something at me for that statement, don't worry, I'm coming back to it. Um, uh, what about splitting keys? So this means, uh, what about putting keys in two different areas and then joining them together? Uh, Non-sensitive keys, application keys, this is what I was talking about with encryption, and what about if I obfuscate my code so no one can understand. So the first one, Base64, is not encryption, it's encoding, and it's completely useless for security. Uh, the tool that I use, GG Shield, automatically unencodes un Base64. Um, so this is absolutely no level of security, and please don't call it encrypt encryption. Uh, splitting keys. I'll give you that splitting keys makes it slightly harder for the attacker in the sense that I can't just use a GG something like GG Shield to scan it because if the keys are split, uh, it won't know that they're partial keys. But if you're relying on slightly harder as your level of security, then you've probably got a big problem, um, and I just suggest doing it anyway. Non-sensitive keys, uh, yeah, uh, I agree that there are some keys that don't give me complete access. However, they tell a story. They let you know information. I'm all, as an attacker, I'm always wanting more and more information uh, to try and put it together so I can coordinate it uh, in, in, in an attack that, that I can effectively use. So having any kind of keys in there, and it also means that uh, it gives me opportunity that if you've done something wrong, if you've misconfigured something on your end, uh, then that's opening the door for me in lots of ways. Uh, application keys, this is uh, acceptable as long as you store them in the key store or somewhere similar. And code obfuscation, it's useless to maybe slightly harder, um, but it doesn't re really matter. Uh, so this is what like code obfuscation looks like. There's some options, you know, in the Android manifest, you can, you can select minify, 
this kind of makes the code less human readable, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't stop me using a scanning tool to be able to find these secrets. Um, it just makes it harder for me as a human to look through and understand what the secrets do. This is the tip of the iceberg. There's lots of examples what you can do uh, to make code obfuscated, but really uh, don't waste your energy on trying to make it harder for someone to understand. Put your energy into making it secure. Uh, so some things that you can actually do. So signing your application. So code signing, you know, is basically proving that this application in its current state hasn't been modified, that the author is correct, and there, and you need those signatures to be able to authenticate with services. This isn't in replace of storing them securely on your back end. This is another level of security that you should absolutely have. It means that if you make a mistake and I, the attacker, find your API keys, I can't simply use my machine to manipulate them and, and extract information. Uh, limit your IP addresses to known machines. So if you have a service that's only meant to connect to this other service, make sure it can only connect to that other service. Uh, limit your API keys to minimal scope. Uh, so the amount of times that I will find read, write access or admin keys for, uh, for a, a job where someone's just trying to ingest information. So you're just trying to pull information, read information from an Amazon S3 bucket and you've given me uh, admin keys to do that. Um, the, some people argue that this is more secure because you have less keys to manage, but that's a totally bullshit uh, excuse. You're just lazy, so please make sure you, you, if you need to create more keys, create more keys to limit the IP. Uh, and then set up access rules. So what I mean by access rules is in things like uh, Firebase, you can set up security rules to be able to understand exactly uh, uh, what, people, what people can do and restrict the limits that you can. So we, we should be doing all of these. None of this is to replace storing the key securely. That's kind of number one. But what happened here is none of these companies, none of these apps that I've scanned think that they have secrets in their mobile applications. No one's doing it really on purpose. It happens because people don't understand the technology and how it's all compiled. Um, so we need to add additional layers of levels of security to catch it when the mistakes happen. When, not if, when the mistakes happen, because they absolutely, uh, definitely will happen. Uh, and there's a couple more things uh, that we can do uh, to prevent uh, our secrets from, from leaking. So the number one here is a change in mindset. And that is kind of assume that you're going to be breached. Assume that your source code is, is public. Uh, if you adopt the attitude that an attacker is going to get into your, get into your application, get into your source code, then you're going to change your mindset about how you handle things in there. For me, this is really one of the, the number one rules that we should absolutely be dealing with is kind of changing this mindset so that we're assuming that we're going to be breached. We know that our source code is going to be looked at from malicious things. And if we put that hat on, then it becomes a lot easier to be able to secure it. And we know a lot more about how to do that. Uh, use automated secrets detection. So mistakes happen, secrets end up out there in the wild. What you can do is use tools like GG Shield to scan your applications after they've been compiled, to scan your code repositories and make sure no secrets are in there. As an attacker, I'm always going to be using automated secrets detection. There's heaps of bug bounty tools out there, like Git leaks, like Trufflehog, that we can that we can use as attackers to, to find secrets. So we, uh, as security, as blue teamers, need to adopt the same approaches uh, when it comes to identifying them and preventing them from leaking out in the first place. Uh, restrict access, we've talked about this, you know, uh, whitelist services, short-lived credentials. Uh, one of my biggest gripes is people not rotating credentials. If you're using uh, secrets, make sure you, you have rotation policies in place. This does two things. One, it means if a key gets leaked, then it shouldn't have a long lifespan, so it's not valid for long. And two, and if you're regularly rotating keys, it means you know how to do it. So if a key gets leaked, you know what that key is for and you know how to rotate it. The amount of times that someone will find a key and no one has any idea what that gives access to. And you don't know if revoking that key is going to shut down and destroy production. Um, so you kind of just ignore it and hope the problem goes away. But if we have a rotation policy in place, then we can regularly rotate these keys um, so that they're not a problem. Uh, use a, a honey tokens is one of my favorite things at the moment is just using fake credentials to identify when, when you're being attacked um, and give, give the attackers something to, to, to chew on. Honeypots are fantastic ways, lines of defense. Ensure your secrets are always server-side. Don't put any secrets in your mobile applications, even if you think that they don't do anything. 
Uh, and the other one is uh, we find a lot of these because there's misconfigurations. You know, misconfigurations in your Firebase, misconfigurations in your S3 buckets. Um, we absolutely want to try and reduce that, use infrastructure as code because it means it's replicatable, and then use infrastructure as code scanning to try and identify these misconfigurations. I know some of these are a little bit outside of the talk today, but this is just kind of uh, 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 my opinion of kind of things that we absolutely should, should do. So I'm a little bit early, uh, but thanks. I have a, if you found this talk interesting, I actually have another talk uh, tomorrow at 5 to 5.45, um, where we're going to be looking at how we can explore lots of things, like how we can do basically the same thing. There'll be lots of demos of how we can abuse Docker images and package managers, um, find misconfigurations and find secrets. So if you're interested in this topic, um, I'll be speaking again tomorrow in this room at 5 to 5.45. Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank everyone for paying attention and being here with me today. It's been really, really cool for me to be able to speak at B-Sides uh, Las Vegas, uh, one, of the, one of the goals I had. So thanks everyone for being here and uh, making it possible. And uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, preferably easy ones, then please let me know. Yeah? Just a second, please. Oh, sorry. No, sorry, that's my fault. Oh, uh, I'm I'm actually kind of like behind on like the Mac OS operating system. Can you just download iOS apps to Macs these days? No, you can't. You have to use uh, an intermediary. So if you're like, uh, if I go back, uh, I use the tool here called IPA tool. Um, so that's how so that's how you do it. But um, it, it can be tricky to kind of like use these things if you just want to do some experiments. There are Play Store and App Store mirrors that do allow you to download it. Just be careful because about 80% of them are super dodgy delivering malware to you. Um, but there are, there are some legitimate ones too. Yeah. Yes? Uh, your proposed solution is effectively back in for front end. Is, is, uh, is it, sorry? So it's, it's, a, it's effectively back in for front end. Yeah. 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 And so it puts a lot of. Um, onus on the user to make sure they're using the correct application, right? So you could have a forged app that tricks the user into presenting their credentials to the back end, and then the back end gives the forged app the credentials, right? Yeah, but I think that's a, that, I mean, that's an issue, like a forged application is an issue for regardless of whether you're, you're doing this, because I mean, how, if you've got a download a mobile application, you need to authenticate somewhere. So you're going to be, uh, you know, asking your user for credentials to log in. Um, so that, I mean, that does put the onerous on the user to make sure that they're using the legitimate application, uh, but this is, but this is absolutely an issue that we're facing uh, regardless. I don't think that forcing it to go back end changes that, um, because if, if you don't need to log in to an application, then what your back end can do is send your, your data. So you've got a public app, you just open it up and you can do stuff. You, you can still fetch public data. So like it might even just be an RSS that your backend is producing so that you can download it if you don't need to, to log in. But by putting the credentials in the front, in the front of that, you know, you're, you're, you're asking for trouble of, of people being able to manipulate that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, over there. I think it's more for the, the videos. Yeah. So uh, would you suggest that there's any value at all at putting either certificates in like an MTLS type situation or cert pinning situation or an API key in an APK or app at all? Or is because of the, the, the ability to pull them out so easily, there's really no value there? I, I would say there's absolutely no value. It's the same as if, you know, I think you just assume that the, the source code, like, if you, can you put your source code in a public GitHub repository? If the answer is no, then that's not uh, at a hygiene level that you should be creating an APK from, from, from that. Um, now, there's lots of people that will say things like, what about uh, whether, uh, like, maps, Google Maps API keys or, you know, weather API keys or something that really offers no value for what I can do. And the answer to that is, like, these things still charge. Now, I'm not going to be able to get into your infrastructure because of a, a weather API key or a Google Maps API key. These are ones that we find everywhere. Uh, but you have given me a button that if I press this button, I'm going to charge you one cent or what? 0.01 cent. 
right? Now, if I really dislike you, I'm going to push that button a lot, and I'm going to automate that pushing of the button so that you get a big build. So it's still not like, okay, I'm not going to be able to shut down your application, but there's still lots of things that you can do uh, to be able to do that, just to be able to, it's for your competitors to run up bills for you, make you unsustainable. I mean, even a $1,000 Maps API bill is, is, is going to be very suspicious and kind of painful to pay. So I think there's no value. People always argue, argue with me about like certain types of keys um, and, and whether or not you've configured it so that nothing but your app can use it. And I agree that all of that's good, uh, but you're relying on the fact that everything has to be perfect all the time. Your infrastructure has to be perfect 100% of the time. I don't like the saying that attackers only need to be right once because truthfully they need to be right lots of times to get there. But you know, it is kind of true in this sense that you're, you're, you're one mistake away from, from that key being useful to me. And as an attacker, you know, especially if I'm malicious, I, I can do stuff with it. So I'd say absolutely no value. You can argue what you want, but I don't think my position will change. <laughs> Yeah. Just wait one second for the for the mic. Yeah. Uh, how about storing the MTLS client keys in the app uh, in the vault, like you mentioned, Secrets Manager? Yeah. So is that the standard practice? Uh, it should be. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, like putting putting secrets. See, there's different levels. The talk after me is going to is going to discuss. Secrets maturity model, uh, like some different levels of what to do, uh, and there's different levels to it. Um, now, I, I differ from the 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 general security opinion of this. So, if we look at the very highest level, we use HashiCorp Vault. We're using dynamic secrets, so secrets are being generated and destroyed after one-time use. All our secrets are centralized there. That's the best practice. But is that reasonable for a small company to be able to manage? a heavy tool like HashiCorp Vault and that. So then you go down a level, um, and, I, and I say like, no, no if you, because the chances are you're not gonna use it properly. And you develop it, you, you're, you're, you're not there yet in your maturity, so you shouldn't try and force this crazy tool on them. If you go down and you have secrets managers, if you're using AWS or GCP, they have secrets managers. They're less secure with less features, but they do the job, you know, and, and so I, I'm an advocate for, uh, be reasonable with what you want. Okay, aim for the vault. Have a path to get there. Um, but if that is what you need, because the argument that I have is because people always argue with this. I'm all about finding secrets in weird and wacky and wonderful places. So um, you're arguing, should I use vault? I'm saying just don't put them in your damn APK. <laughs> like, you know, like let's start there. Don't put them in your source code. We can talk vault all you want, but we're not at the stage where we can, you know, so just use whatever you're going to use. Vault is the best, or other, there's other services out there, like 1Password has some good ones, or they've got some new developer tools, Doppler, Akeelis, lots of tools out there that do great, great things in managing secrets. Um, but just pick the right tool and, and actually use it, and just make sure you're not hard-coding secrets. Just start there, and then we'll, we'll, we'll work, worry about the rest, yeah. Hopefully that answers your question. Oh, Matt. This one's going to be hard. I can feel it. <laughs> no, uh, I'm really kind of curious. Um, where areas do you see for improvement for that secret scanning aspect of it? Because a lot of things look like passwords. Uh, so, mm -hmm. um, how do you see you know areas that need additional research to make your job easier to find these secrets? Yeah. So, I mean, secret scanners are actually getting better and better uh, all the time. I think a few years ago, secret scanners were kind of creating lots and lots of false positives. I mean, at GitGatting, we've put lots of work into reducing that. How we do it for, it's easy for secrets that you know, it's like an AWS key or Twilio key, because I can check with the service. Hey, is this real? Yes or no? Yes? Okay, good. So that means I can cast a wide net. It gets tricky when you're talking about generic secrets, secrets that are for systems that you've built that I have no idea exist. And so how we've managed to do that is we've, we've created flags and post validation. So we find a high entry string, looks like a secret. What else clues in this, you know, do we know? Can we understand what this code is doing to flag it? And we've been doing that. But in all honesty, I think that secret detection and a high quality secret detection over the next four years is going to become an absolute given. Like you, you won't get away with having crappy uh, secret detection. AI is helping in this to be able to digest that. So we have a record of uh, everything that's happened on GitHub for the last seven years publicly. So now with some machine learning and AI, we can really start training it. I think that the detection is going to get as good as it possibly can quickly. Um, 
But I think where the problem comes in, and particularly as large enterprises, is not so much the detection of it. It's more like how do you actually effectively remediate this issue? You've got a thousand secrets. You've got two AppSec engineers. Like, you know, like how, like what are they going to do all year? All they're doing is rotating secrets and investigating them. So to me, it's all about streamlining that remediation process and improving that area so that we actually know what to do. And then um, not just putting secret detection in like your source code or code repositories, put it everywhere along the, along the way. Do Git hooks to prevent them getting in the code repositories. Do scans after your application has been compiled. Uh, all, all of that kind of area. So, I mean, there's lots that can be improved. I think detection itself is getting better and better across the broad, not just with us, but to everyone, even the open source tools are getting really good. Um, so I feel like that's going to be a given, which hopefully will help. Um, but where it's going to get complicated is what, what you do after you found them. How do you actually deal with that? Any other questions? Everybody, let's give it up for Mackenzie. Thanks, everyone.